50 years ago this month, the country faced a massive economic change, which had been brewing for over three years. Earlier this month in February, the nation marked the 50th anniversary since the UK switched to decimal currency. Half a century ago, or maybe I should actually say 0.5 centuries ago in decimal, in 1971 the UK and Irish currency looked very different. Not just the coins themselves, but the way the currency worked. Before then, Britain used a monetary system that dated back thousands of years to the Roman Empire. And the problem with the old pounds, shillings and pence system, now called old money, is that it was based on multiples of 12 and 240. This made it quite confusing. There were 12 pennies in a shilling, and 240 pennies in a pound, and 20 shillings made a pound. Certainly not easy to add up in your head. However, until February 1971, no one really questioned it. That's just how things were. Then came Decimal Day, known as D-Day, the change to the current system we use today, and one that was met with significant outrage and anxiety at the time. Decimalisation left behind the old pounds, shillings and pence, and introduced the decimalised coins we know today. The pounds, shillings and pence system included lots of coins with very different names to today's coinage. A lot of these coins were given slang nicknames, such as thruppence or thruppenny bit for a threepence, or a tanner for a sixpence. A shilling was sometimes called a bob, and a ten shilling note would often be referred to as a ten bob note. But did you know that the UK wasn't the first country, or the first European country, to go decimal. In fact, as early as 1704, Russia introduced the ruble, which was equal to 100 kopecks, making it the first European country to have a decimal coin. It was followed by France, which introduced the franc in 1795. So the UK actually became one of the last countries to turn decimal. And the new decimal coins were issued well before decimal day in 1971, in fact, three years earlier. In 1968, the plans for decimalisation were set in motion. To try and help the public acclimatise to the new decimal coins, the 5p and the 10p were issued, followed by the 50p a year later in 1969. This meant that these coins circulated alongside their pre-decimal shil siblings, shilling, florin and 10 bob note, and were used interchangeably. By 1971, when the pre-decimal coinage ceased to be legal tender, only three new coins would need to be introduced, the half pence, the one pence and the two pence, making the jump to decimal currency a little bit easier for the public. Many people worried that shopkeepers would inflate the prices of products during the changeover. But with a public information campaign that ran for almost two years, many people already had some idea of the conversions. And to help currency converters, were made available to people and shops display the, the, the prices in both currencies before and after decimal day. People could also continue to pay in old money, but they would receive their change in the new money. And it took some time, but soon the decimal currency became familiar to everyone and continues to be the biggest change to the UK coinage in thousands of years. In 1982, they stopped calling it new pence and now called it pence. And you might even remember Decimal Day in 1971 yourself, perhaps using conversion charts and rhymes to learn the new currency and the excitement of seeing the new coins in your change. But that wasn't the first time that the British government had tried to introduce decimal currency. Actually, in the 1820s, discussion for a new decimal currency had already begun. And in 1849, a new decimal coin, the florin, was introduced in the UK. But its introduction didn't go quite as planned, and decimalisation was then delayed for almost 130 years because of it. The florin first entered circulation in 1849, and had a value of one-tenth of a pound, or 24 pence, in old money. Supposedly, the name came from a similar coin issued in the Netherlands to help with decimalisation there. The florin, or two-shilling coin, featured a special portrait of Queen Victoria, in a medieval Gothic style, and it was the first time since Charles II that a monarch was depicted on a portrait wearing a crown. The Gothic portrait was featured on the florin 
when it was first introduced in 1849. But because the bust was larger than the previous young head portrait, the design had to omit ten very important letters. The words Dia Gratia had been removed from the coin's inscription. In a deeply religious society, the fact that the words actually meaning by the grace of God no longer appeared on the coin caused an absolute outrage. Many people believed that the lack of inscription had angered God and caused famine and sickness at the time, leading many to avoid the coin altogether. And the public outrage meant that the design was altered to include a shorter version of Diagratia, the words letters DG, by making the diameter of the coin two millimetres bigger. This coin soon became the Gothic florin and was better received by the public, but it's safe to say that the disaster with what was known as the godless florin tainted the idea of decimalisation for many years. It also meant that the godless florin circulated for just a few years, making it one of the shortest lived coins in our history. And you can still find the letters DG on all the decimal coins if you look for them. The Victorians then made a second attempt at decimalisation in 1887 in the form of the double florin, equivalent to one-fifth of a pound or 48 pennies, issued with a new portrait of Queen Victoria for her jubilee. One of the features that makes the double florin stand out in history is that it was almost indistinguishable from the crown coin, which was five new shillings, or five shillings, which was more valuable. Neither carried the denomination of the coin, and the only difference between the two, apart from the value, was that the double florin was two millimetres smaller, not something that was very easy to spot by eye. And because the two coins were so easily confused, it was off, and it was often barmaids who were most susceptible to the confusion between the two. And anecdotal evidence suggests more than a few of those barmaids lost their livelihood as a result of shortchanging people. And as a result, the double florin earned the nickname the Barmaid's Ruin. So after only four years in circulation, the double florin was withdrawn from circulation completely by 1890. The florin, however, as a denomination, did circulate until 1993, when it was eventually demonetised. And whilst there were countless experiments with coinage and new denominations under Queen Victoria, it seemed that the UK wasn't really quite ready for a change as big as decimalisation. And one of the reasons that it was so difficult to change over was the way the banks kept their records. In 1971, very few banks used digital systems. So on 10th of February, the banks closed for four days until decimal day. This allowed all outstanding cheques to be cleared in old money and all customers' accounts to be converted into decimal coinage. And because most of the banks weren't computerised, this had to be done manually. February was actually chosen as it was the quietest time of the year for banks, shops and public transport. And it's hard to imagine the banks closing for four days in a row now. What an interesting story. Yet now as we look back, it is difficult to understand why people were so worried about the change. But people do worry about change, and particularly if it affects what they have and own. Western society today is built on capitalistic principles, and over the last year the combination of the COVID-19 pandemic and Brexit has had a huge impact on our wealth and security. The International Monetary Fund described the global decline as the worst since the Great Depression of the 1930s. It said the pandemic had plunged the world into a crisis like no other. The fund added that a prolonged outbreak would test the ability of governments and central banks to control the crisis. Gita Gopinath, the IMF's chief economist, said the crisis could knock £7.2 trillion off global GDP over the next two years. An amazing number. And UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak has pledged billions of pounds in wage subsidies and loan guarantees to help workers and businesses through the shutdown. But at some time in the future, this will all have to be paid for somehow. The Bank of England has also slashed interest rates to a new low, freed up billions of pounds for commercial banks to lend in an attempt to shore up the economy. Thousands of people will be without work, and it's no wonder that people are struggling to manage. There will be job losses, 
and many personal tragedies, mental health issues arising all the time. But where can we find peace and security? You know, Jesus asked his disciples, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And how can we find real peace, joy and hope in such a transient and anxious world? You know, many people talk, turn to yoga or gurus or feel-good seminars, legitimately looking for ways to fill the empty void in their lives. Others may turn to alcohol or drugs in their search for ways to deaden the pain. Yet none of the above will provide the sense of peace for which we are all searching. Only a connection to God can provide that ultimate peace. And for Christians, our path to God is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His death opened up a way to restore our relationship with God. And through his resurrection, we have been given the hope of salvation. It's important for us to remember that our physical lives don't last forever. But our souls will last an eternity. And thus, we should place even more emphasis on the health of our souls than the health of our bodies or our bank balances. We all need to be loved uh, to be loved by others and to love. And since God is love, he is the ultimate source of nourishment for our souls. You know, 50 years ago, a major change occurred in our money. And yet now most people have forgotten the anxiety and worry that it brought. And a hundred years from now, very few of us will be remembered by anybody living at the time. So if we focus all our attention on the successes of this world, what will it have gained for us? When we die, our money, fame and honours will all become meaningless. Actually, we own nothing in this world. Everything we think we own is in reality only being loaned to us until we die. And on our deathbed, at the moment of death, no one but God has the ability to save our souls. And the happiest people I've ever seen are often those Individuals who have very little in the way of material comforts or public recognition, yet they have experienced the love of God in their hearts and have trusted God to look after them. They had a sense of community and fellowship and belonging. And the good news is that out of loss and pain and insecurity can come a rebirth. So what do you trust in today? My prayer is that we will all find love and peace in our own lives through giving our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, who will give us a fresh start and provide us with the means of living a fulfilling and joyful life. And if you'd like to find out more about the good news of Jesus, then please contact us using the details at the end of the video. Thanks for listening, and may God richly bless you. Amen.